What are you thankful for? Uh, my dog and my brothers. Do you like your dog or your brothers better? My dog. What are you thankful for? Thankful for my family and plants. What kind of plants? Really all plants, because plants give us AO. What are you thankful for? Um, sushi and garbanzo beans. <laughs> I'm thankful for having food. What kind of food? Um, turkey, gravy, chicken. What are you thankful for? My school and my friends. Which friends? Sydney and Taylor. My toys. Fried chicken, nachos, burritos, chili fries. Um, good food. Um, no, processing technology. Minecraft. <laughs> Ice cream, cake, a cupcake. What's the weirdest thing you're thankful for? The weirdest thing I'm thankful for is that my dad said something that made me that made me laugh. What was it? There was a unicorn, and the unicorn made a rainbow, and the rainbow was so pretty the bumper fell off the car. Bacon and pancakes. Uh, Waffles. And hot dogs and popcorn and <laughs> corn dogs. The simple things of life that we sometimes take for granted, but yet we should have thankful hearts for. Today's scripture talks about uh, someone who had a thankful heart and some others who did not take advantage of the opportunity to show a thankful heart. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke the 17th chapter, verses 11 through 19. Hear the word of God. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Friends, the word of God for the people of God. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. So we are now just some 90 hours or so away from official Thanksgiving Day. For some, that means family gatherings around a table. For others, it may mean gatherings around a table with a chair that's empty for a loved one who's no longer here. For others, there may be a time in feelings of loneliness as they maybe aren't surrounded by others. Yet others may find themselves having to work while others, it may mean something totally different. But it's still Thanksgiving Day. A day and a season to be thankful for the blessings that we have. For some, that may be easy. For others, it may be hard. Yesterday, we were at uh, Lily, my five-year-old daughter's soccer game, the, the last game of the season. And prior to the game starting, Lily announces that she's hungry and needs a snack. And so we pull out a package of Cheez-Its and we give it to her and, and she opens it up and every child in the park has a sixth sense to detect when a package of Cheez-Its has opened because they all came running to where Lily was at. Now Lily attempted to stand behind me. 
hide behind the tree, behind the bench, whatever she could do to protect those Cheez-Its. Eventually, she offers Cheez-Its to two of the girls. They take a handful and pop them in the mouth and begin to run off. And their parents stop them and say, wait a minute, aren't you going to at least say thank you? To which they said, nope, and they ran off. <laughs> now, I can't help but think about what ch my childhood was like in my household, uh, where my parents were very insistent upon saying please and thank you and you're welcome for all that uh, we are blessed with. I continue to try to live my adult life in the same way. And living with a thankful heart. All of our goals should be to live life with a thankful heart. A thankful heart towards God for all that He does. But what happens when you don't feel like life is great and your hearts aren't thankful? How do you get your heart to become a thankful heart? What does a thankful heart even look like? Well, let's go back to this scripture where we find Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Traveling along the border between Galilee and Samaria. In kind of this uh, no man's land. Where he, um, we experience this miraculous healing of ten men with leprosy as Jesus enters into the village. Now, leprosy in biblical terms could, um, uh, could support or imply many different things. But in this story, uh, what is meant uh, with this leprosy is the most severe types of leprosy. Uh, the type that's contagious, this skin disease. What happens with leprosy is that your body can no longer resist or overcome the bacteria and it multiplies rapidly throughout your entire body, all throughout your skin. You lose all sensation and feeling. You get these white patches and lumps in the skin all over you, from your toes all the way up to your head. They're on your eyelids, on your throat on your uh, ears, and you don't feel anything, you most likely end up going blind. Your face becomes so disfigured that your own family may not even recognize who you are. The strength in your muscles deteriorates so quickly that you need assistance to walk. These people who at one point were, were uh, uh, symptom-free, had no problem, and now all of a sudden have been struck with this skin disease. Now to some, we may think that doesn't sound that terrible. But think about this for just a moment. You feel nothing. There are no warning signs when your body attempts to tell you that you're too hot because your skin doesn't feel it. When you're too cold, you can't feel it. When bugs and things are crawling on you, you can't feel it. When your child or your spouse, your loved one, reaches out to hold your hand, you can't feel it. You can't find the comfort that comes in a loving touch. Not being able to feel something could even cost you your life. And that's just the good part of leprosy. Uh, you see, these explanations uh, of leprosy, this is just the physical side of the disease. What about the emotional side of it? You see, people with leprosy were marginalized. They were separated from the rest of society. They were outcast into no man's land. They were considered unclean and were considered sinners. Living in isolation, not allowed to touch or hug their spouses and children. They were considered so unclean that they were not even allowed to enter into the temple to worship God. Can you imagine being told that because of a condition in our life that we were not welcome into the church to worship God? We can't imagine this. And this is their diagnosis, their situation. 
Leviticus 17 tells us a little bit more about people with leprosy. It says this, The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face, and cry out. Now listen to this part. They have to cry out if anyone comes around them. They have to cry out about themselves, unclean, unclean. It says, as long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone, and he must live outside the camp. Can we relate to this? Maybe we don't know someone with leprosy. And if we do, hopefully and prayerfully, they're not outcast, uh, that they're able to worship and be around others. But perhaps we know of people who feel like outcasts in life because of their beliefs, their choices, the way they dress or talk. Maybe it's because of the group that they run around with. Maybe it's because of their finances, their economic or social status. Maybe we have all felt like an outcast at some point in our own lives. Not accepted for who we are, for what we do, for how we live. Leaving us feeling alone. Not normal. Unwanted or unloved. Or even worse, unworthy of being loved. Probably all of us here at some point has felt like I have no reason in my life to have a thankful heart. Surely that's how these ten men with leprosy felt. People made fun of them. They were outcasts. They couldn't interact. Kids were probably uh, lodging insults at them. Separated from humanity. A permanent label of being unclean. But look what happens. They see Jesus from a distance. And they call out, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. You see, if you were labeled unclean, not only was it against the law, to be around people, to have interaction with them. But the only way to have the label of unclean being removed was to have a priest remove the label, to say that you are now clean. So Jesus tells them, take yourselves and show, show yourselves to the priest. Now, he didn't get up and walk over to them. He didn't have them kneel down before them and he laid hands up on them. So I imagine they're feeling somewhat skeptical that really, is anything even going to happen here? I mean, they didn't all, all of a sudden, immediately when Jesus spoke, uh, these bumps and, 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 and whelps did not just fall off. But Jesus, he's about to rock their world. They don't know what's about to happen. And with no reason for them to have a thankful heart, Jesus shows up where they are at in their most greatest times of need. Where they needed him the most, Jesus showed up to this land of outcast. And he asked them, have faith and just go to the priest. Friends, if we are not sure that we think we can find a reason to have a thankful heart, then maybe we need to look more closely. Maybe we need to look at the video of the children and recognize the simple things in life that we have to be thankful for. To recognize that they're from God. Maybe we need to slow down and call out, Jesus, Master, have pity on me. He's already there. He's surrounding us. He's uh, preparing us to live life out in accordance to His will. We have to have faith like he calls us to. We can be grateful. We can be thankful for all the things we have in life. We can be thankful for the very breath of life that he breathed into us. 
we can be thankful for His Word in the Bible that tells us this is how we should live life. So these men, they head down this path, this path towards the priest where Jesus told them to go. And, and, and they're going, and I imagine all of a sudden one of them is like, hey, wait a second, something's happening. These, these bumps, these whelps, this disease, this illness is going away. And, and, and they're excited, and I imagine they're, they're screaming shouts of celebration. They're crying tears of joy. Excited knowing that, look, this terrible way of living life, the way I've become accustomed, it is now going to get to be behind me. All we have to do is get to the priest, be labeled as clean, and we can go home. Things got busy, and they began to take their focus off of God. See, now they have a reason to be thankful. But they let the busyness of life get in the way. You know they had to be excited. Anxious to get home to their loved ones. At one point, ten men with leprosy prayed out to God in their time of need. And when God met their need, one stopped and turned around and came back to Jesus. Is it possible that we get so busy with our own lives, so crazy, caught up in the hustle and bustle of living, that we miss opportunities to praise God, to be thankful for all that He does in our life? A few weeks ago, I was talking to a lady who come, came asking for financial assistance with her rent. I asked her, uh, how did you make in, uh, ends meet last month? How did you pay your rent then? And she said, I prayed a lot. I prayed that God was going to provide. And I'm like, this, that's great. How did it end up? And she said, well, I kind of got tired. God wasn't answering. So I went to a church and they, and they wrote the check. I can't help but wonder if we are not all at risk of thinking this way sometimes. That we ask God for help. We pray to Him in our greatest times of need. Just like these men with leprosy. And then when we get our prayer answered, when it happens, we think it's because someone else did it. We think it's because we've done something ourselves. That we have got ourselves out of that jam. We take the credit for ourselves. In essence, robbing God... The opportunity of being praised and thanked. And we know it's right to give thanks and praise. On the first Sunday of every month, we share our communion liturgy and we read it in our liturgy. It is right to give thanks and praise. We have to slow down, stop letting the busyness of life take our focus off of God and take our focus off of thanking God. I'm not saying these other nine men weren't thankful. They had to be thankful. They were healed. But only one came back to give thanks. All were healed. All their prayers were answered. But one came back. A thankful heart. Take into consideration what we are thankful for. When we have thankful hearts, it's not the gift or the blessing that we are truly thankful for. But instead, it's the person who gave the gift or blessing that we are thankful for. A good example of that is anyone who has children. You, you remember when they were little, how on Father's Day and Mother's Day and birthdays, you got the mugs and the ties that you never wore to work. And, and, and they meant the world to you. You never, ever got rid of them. They're still in a box somewhere at home because it's not that those gifts themselves were so special. It's not that those were what you were so thankful for. It's the heart. It's the condition in which our children gave us the gift. That's what we're thankful for. This Samaritan in this story is so overwhelmed and thankful that God cared enough about him in his time of need, in the middle of his illness, that God stopped and healed him. 
And before he ran off to show it to someone else, to show his wife, to show his children, he stopped. He turned around and he went back to Jesus. And he said, thank you. Overwhelmed, emotional, set free from this skin disease. Probably with trembling voices, a uh, trembling voice when he gets to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And it says he throws himself at Jesus' feet and he worships him. When Jesus answers our prayers, even if it's a different answer than what we had hoped for, do we go back to him? Or forget going back to him. Do we stop and run back to him? Do we throw ourselves at his feet? And do we worship him for answering our prayers? Do we give him thanks and praise? Because we should. God is wherever we're at in life. There is no situation that he's not in that he can't provide for. Colossians 4.2 reminds us that. It says that we should be watchful for God. That we should be thankful to God for all things. This is the key to having a thankful heart. It's all in how you see the situation. It's recognizing what's actually happening. In just a few days, many people will venture out on Friday, what's known as Black Friday, the biggest shopping day of the year, joined by hundreds of thousands of people standing in line. Let me tell you how fun this does not sound. When you can't find a parking place close enough to the building and you park a mile and a half away and you have to make that long trek into the building, instead of complaining that you couldn't find a parking place, maybe we should stop and be thankful that we have a car. Maybe we should stop and be thankful that we have two legs that we can walk ourselves into the building. Or when your boss calls and says, I need you to come in for a few hours this weekend. Instead of complaining to our family, maybe we should be praising God, being thankful to God that we have a job, that we have a paycheck that's coming in. Maybe when we go to bed hungry, instead of blaming God and cursing God, we thank Him that we have the very breath of life within us, that Jesus is our bread of life, a true and thankful heart starts with how we look at things. It's true in every situation of life. When Hurricane Harvey came through our area, my family was not prepared to have a home that flooded. We weren't prepared by having flood insurance like we should have. As the water quickly began to make its way into our house, I called my wife Karen, who was at work, and I told her, we're going to flood. I got the girls upstairs. The dogs went with us. Plenty of food and water. But the water continued to come into the house. I wasn't sure when it was going to stop. I'd been watching the news coverage and seen, been, uh, seen the coverage of just five, six streets over, how they had already had six feet of water in the house hours earlier. I didn't know when this was going to end. Carefully watching through the upstairs window, looking out at the front of the house as I slowly watched the mailbox begin to fade under the water. All while Karen has decided to jump in her county vehicle and uh, do her best to make it home to help me get the kids out of the house. I now have the added stress and worry about a wife who's on the road as well as children and animals in the house. Eventually, I call Karen and say, it's time. I've got to take the girls out. Recognizing that it's not probably smart to carry both girls, to have both arms occupied, one needing to be freed so I could get out to dry grounds. I had to make the hardest decision a parent should ever have to make in life. Which child do you leave behind in the house? placing life jackets on the five-year-old and the one-year-old. Uh, I make the decision that the one-year-old laying in a crib can't get out and wander into the water, so to take the five-year-old. As we open the door, a spotlight from the top of the street shines down on our house. My wife 
has made it to the top of the street. We can't get into the water with her vehicle. So I carry Lily out, who cries and screams at the top of her lungs, I want Hunter! I want Hunter! Her big brother, who had just gone off to college the week before. Each step of the way, we prayed out, God, give us strength. Give us another step, one more step. We get her to the top of the street, and I hand her off to Karen, who places her in her vehicle. And I turn around, and I pray out aloud again, Lord God, get me back into the house. Get me back to little grace each step of the way. And God knew what he was doing. Because as I got sweet little grace and carried her outside, she's the exact opposite of her sister. She laughed hysterically as rain hit her face. Almost as if God was soothing my soul with each step into the water. Do I have wished we would not have flooded? Of course. But I'm thankful to God. For this has brought my family closer together. It has reminded me how blessed we are with friends like you who have reached out and loved us with your thoughts and your prayers, who have written notes of encouragements to my family, to my children, who have prepared hot meals for us to be able to eat, who have helped us in the rebuilding process. I am thankful that God has brought faithful people in, into my life, that God has cared for us enough to watch us to that level. I am so thankful and grateful for this church and their response to this community. To uh, how under Tony's leadership, how we orchestrated this, this shop of all needs, everything needed for the community, we were there. We were going to be that church. For the teams all around the nation who continue to come in to stay right here with us in our church to go back out into the community and to work in these homes. God has blessed us, and we are thankful for God in this situation. It's how we look at it. No matter what any of us go through in life, we can have thankful hearts if we choose to have thankful hearts. In our scripture this morning, Jesus, he was headed to Jerusalem. He knows what it's like to be challenged to have a thankful heart in times of distress. You see, he was headed to be crucified. And right before this happens, he gathers around a table. And what does he do? He exhibits a thankful heart as he takes the bread and juice and as he gives thanks to the Father. We can also be thankful and have thankful hearts that Jesus cares for all people. Yes, even the marginalized. Those who are outcasts living in no man's land. You see, he sees them as his children. And he offers his love and his grace to all his children. So friends, we are to be thankful in all that we do. In all that happens in our life, be thankful. I'd like to challenge each of us here to choose to have a thankful heart and to praise God, to make it a habit to thank Him every single day, in every single scenario of life, for the blessings that He bestows upon us and the fact that He gives us the ability to have a thankful heart. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you for how you continuously watch over us. For how you meet us in the darkest places of life. To say, I will walk through this with you. Uh, to call us to have faith in what you ask us to do. Lord, we pray for the strength the courage, the focus to live lives with thankful hearts. Praising you all the way. For you are worthy of our praise. Amen.